three. All right, we are going through our series on Acts chapter 27. We've been going verse by verse, taking a chapter every, every week. Uh, and so we are up to chapter 27, so we only have one more a week. And we'll, that won't be until two weeks, uh, because next week is, again, Bibles and Brunch. So remember, do not come in here Sunday morning, but we'll be going over to the fellowship hall. We'll be serving a, a, a breakfast. So just go in that direction. And then two weeks, uh, Nathan will be doing 28, the very last chapter of the book of Acts. So I want to start... Uh, Before I start 27, I just want to kind of show you how the Old Testament ties in to the New Testament. So in Romans chapter 15, if you want to look over there, Romans chapter 15, verse 23. Of course, Paul is writing this letter to the the Roman church. This was before he's ever been to Rome. Uh, He's writing letters to them. And um, he's talking about, let me find the verse here. Actually, I go back to uh, verse, yeah, verse 23. So he's telling them, by now, there's no more place for me to work in these regions. He's talking about Asia, which is, again, in our day, that is modern-day Turkey. I have been longing for many years to see you. I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to visit you while passing through and have you assist me on my journey there. And after I have enjoyed your company for a while, now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the saints there. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make contributions for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do so And indeed, they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, then we owe it to the Jews to share with their material blessings. So after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this fruit, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. So again, I just want to show that Why was it so important for Paul to want to go to Spain? He wants to go to Rome. Of course, that's the seat of the known, you know, of government of the entire known world at the time. But what was the deal with Spain? You don't have to turn there, but I'll give you the reference. Back in um, Deuteronomy chapter 10, we have uh, the table of nations. Okay, all the known nations of the time that they knew about. And the furthest west nation was a nation that in the Old Testament they called Tarshish, where in the New Testament, or in our day, it is called Spain. So the reason Paul was in such adamant of wanting to go to Spain was because he wanted to be part of the process of taking the nations back to the Lord. So after the Tower of Babel, Babel, when all the nations were dispersed in different languages, that was the known world at the time, and he is in the process of taking the gospel to the nations, and at that time, Spain was the furthest west known of the nations. So that's why he's so adamant of getting to Spain. So let's go back to Acts chapter 27, and just kind of re- remind you what's happened up to now. And he, as he mentioned there in Romans, he said that one, you know, that was a reason he went to Jerusalem. He was taking an offering for the poor. And while he was in this process of taking this offering was when they had a riot in the temple, and he was accused of one thing, of stirring up a riot, he was accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple, which both were not true, but he was accused of that. So to make a long story short, he's been two years now in Caesarea as a prisoner, and the Jews are continually trying to get him 
or get the governor to send him back to Jerusalem to stand trial. Although they don't want to put him on trial, they just want to kill him. So he had to appeal to Caesar because as a Roman citizen, he had the right to appeal to Caesar, kind of like our Supreme Court. Uh, And so he did that. So now he's finally, after two years, he's being ready to be actually sent and to go to, to Rome. So we'll start in verse 1. And it says, When we decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the imperial regiment. Okay, it's interesting, this, the we there, of course, is Luke and Paul. Luke's the one writing the book of Acts and also, obviously, the, the gospel of Luke. But it's interesting that how the New Testament always shows the centurions in a positive light. You will find that, um, you just, just think back, okay, you think of Jesus you know, where the centurion had a servant who was dying and he sent some elders to Paul or to uh, Jesus to have him come to heal his servant. And then Jesus was willing to do that. And the, the Jewish elders said, this man is worthy of it. He's, he built our, sim- our synagogue. And, and then as he Jesus was going to go, then he also sends uh, said, you don't need to really come to my house. You can just say the word, and my servant will be healed. And then Jesus says, I have not found such great faith in all of Israel, as the centurion did. And then we think of the centurion with uh, Paul, or actually with Peter, when Peter the centurion was praying in the, in the morning, and a, he had an angel appear to him in a vision, tells him to go send to Joppa to a man named Peter to have him come and share the gospel. So he does that, uh, even though from Peter's aspect, well, this is an unclean Gentile. He goes, and long story short is, the centurion and all his household gets saved. And another one is, think about the centurion who was there at the crucifixion, who was over that. After he sees how Jesus has died, he says, truly, this was the Son of God. So it's amazing that centurions, well-educated people, and for the most part, seem to be morally upright. Now, this centurion's name is Julius, and he's from the Imperial Regiment, in other words, from Rome itself. And, and many scholars believe that he could even be Nero, who was the emperor at the time, could have been his centurion. Okay, let's go to verses 2 and 3. It says, We boarded a ship from Anadrapium, about to sail for the ports along the coast of the province of Asia. And we put out to sea. Aristarchus in Macedonia from Thessalonica was with us. Now he was one of the guys who was from Thessalonica or from Macedonia who was helping bringing a gift that they had gathered from the churches there. The next day we landed at Sidon. And Julius, in his kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to see his friends so that they might provide for his needs. So Julius allowed Paul to go to his friends. And remember that as a Roman soldier, if you let a prisoner escape, you would pay with your own life. So Julius shows his kindness and let him go and be ministered to by the friends in Sidon. And it's interesting that Sidon, we don't have any... uh, in any of his other missionary journeys that Paul went to Sidon. But obviously, he knew people, and there are now Christians there. And so, again, that sh- and Sidon was actually the, the north 
a little farther north than the borders of Israel. So again, it shows, okay, the gospel is going out beyond, beyond Israel and is bringing in the Gentiles. Okay, let's look at verses 4 through 8. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. Now when we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Silica and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There was a uh, centurion there. The centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy, and he put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Sindus. And when the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the lee of Crete opposite Salome. So, they're making very slow progress. You know, this, this voyage is not starting out real well. It's, it's slow and it's tedious as they try to make their way towards Italy. In verse 9, much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the fast. So Paul warned them. Now, the fast they're talking about is the Day of Atonement. Uh, that's the day when all the Jews would fast and mourn. And it was always in late fall. And so any time after that, it was dangerous in the Mediterranean to be sailing. Okay, let's look at verse 10. And Paul, so Paul says, men, I see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and the cargo and to our own lives also. Now, this wasn't a, re a revelation for Paul. This was an opinion, okay? Because Paul was an experienced traveler. He had already been shipwrecked three times. So he knew about sailing and the dangers that go with it. And so he was warning them that this is not a good idea. You know, I've seen this happen before. I've been shipwrecked three times. So I know this is a dangerous process you're going out on. But there's a difference between opinions and revelation. Because you notice he said loss of life. And we know as the story goes on, there wasn't a loss of life. Okay, let's look at 11 and 12. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and Northwest. So Phoenix was going to be a lot more comfortable place to spend the winter. And I think the owner, the captain, which would have been the captain of the ship, called pilot in this case, but was impatient and wanted to get on with the journey, wanted to get there. And sometimes impatience can be a problem for us. You know, I think we always have to realize that if, if you're not getting clear direction, wait. Wait on the Lord. But sometimes we try to make things happen, and it doesn't go well. And that's the case with what's going to happen as we read on in the story. So we're going to look at verse 13 through 15. And it says, when a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeastern swept down from the island. 
The ship was caught by the storm and cannot head into the wind. So we gave way to it, and it was driven along. So he starts out well, but again, impatient caused problems, and not listening to even the advice, the advice of Paul. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Claudia, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, fearing that they would run aground on the sandbar of Cyprus, then lower the anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle aboard, overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. So this made me think about, you know, storms of life. You know, not just necessarily a physical storm, but we all encounter storms. You know, I, I was thinking, we, we were gone this last week, and we went to Tennessee and went to the Smoky Mountains. And uh, about Wednesday, it started raining, and then Wednesday night, it was just pouring and it's about midnight or so, and I saw the electricity went out. Well, that gave me a flashback to 2017 when we were in Colorado, and we were in the midst of a thousand-year flood there. And um, we had woke up in the, in the middle of the night and could hear it raining, pouring. You could even hear the water roaring, and electricity went off. And so we had to wait till daybreak. So when daybreak came, we could still hear the, there were three fishing lakes in this big elk meadows of Colorado. And so we went out down there to look, see what was going on. And we were on the second tier. There's the first tier right by the lakes. And the first dam had given away. And it went down and it took out the second lake. And then it took out the third lake. And then we were split between the people who lived on the other side and our side because those dams also had the roads that went there. So, uh, come to find out, not only was the dams gone, but the road out of that whole development was gone, and the road that, that took, that road that went to the highway, the highway was gone. So, we were stuck. There's no way out. No highway left. There's no roads left. And so it was very interesting because there was a general sense of peace, even though we couldn't figure out what we're going to do. But luckily, there was a, or blessed, I guess we would say, there was a um, sheriff deputy who had come to our development about during the night because there was a 911 call. And he came and, and it was a hang up. And then he went back and then he got it again. So he came back. By the time he came back second time, the roads were gone. So he was stuck with us, but he gave us communications with the sheriff's department and, and, and emergency management. So we were there a couple of days and, you know, you just... You have flashlights, and, and you caught water so we could flush the stools. And, you know, you just, everybody came together and kind of pulled their food together. And about after the second day, or third day, because uh, we knew there was no way out, they brought in a helicopter, and we got, we got one bag. You could take one bag with you, loaded the helicopter, and got flown out. And that was the only helicopter that got in that day because the weather moved back in. So long story short, we ended up being going to the evacuation center. 
We rented a van because my son and his family were with us, and then we got home. He actually got to work on time on Monday morning. So, it, But it was like three months before you could get your vehicles. And we had a lot of people there who had rented cars, and I always wondered, I don't know what happened. Well, I can't get you a car back to you. <clears throat> so in our case, they our insurance company actually paid for our car, even though it wasn't damaged. So we, we were blessed in several ways. But thinking about those storms um, reminded me that, you know, not just talking about physical weather storms, but just the storms of life. You know, sometimes those can come from, uh, you know, due to disobedience. Sometimes it's the Lord's correction. Sometimes it's a, a storm that comes that creates and builds our faith and helps purify us and mature us. Sometimes it's the enemy that's coming in. Maybe it's a, a, diag- a health diagnosis or a relationship issue or a financial crisis. We all have storms that come into our life. There was something, and I don't know who first said this or whether I read it, but years ago, I've never for- forgot this. And it said, before you have power over a storm, you have to have peace in the midst of the storm. So before you can have power over the storm, you have to have peace in the midst of the storm. And that's not always easy. That's where we have to wait in the Lord and, and focus and turn our attention from the emergency to the Lord. You know, Jesus said, in this life, you will have tribulation, our storms. That's a guarantee. That's not one we put on our refrigerator usually, but it's a fact. We will have storms. We will have tribulation. But take heart. He has overcome the world. So keep that always in mind. That before you have power over the storm, you have to have peace in the midst of of that storm. All right, let's go on to verse 21 and 22. And it said, After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sell from Crete. Then you would have been spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your count, your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. So Paul didn't just say, I told you so. He did say, I told you so. But he said, he brought encouragement to them. So it wasn't just, I told you I was right. They said, I got good news. Not one of you will be lost. Verse 23 tells the reason why. He says, last night, an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sell with you. I like that where he says, God, whose I am and whom I serve. I think that needs to be a a mindset that we all have. That God has paid a price for us. And we are God's. And we serve him. So it said, you must stand before Caesar. So think about this. The gospel is going to the highest authority in the known world. Caesar, who is the emperor, who is Nero at this time. And so the Lord has put him in a place, in a situation, and arranged all this so that the very top person, the very top of the known world government is going to get the gospel 
spoken to them, and Paul is going to witness of his own testimony to them. So the Lord had a plan all along. It would not necessarily be the plan maybe we would have chose, but as a prisoner, he gets Paul in the position that he wants him to be in. So, verse 25 says, So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. So Paul encourages them, and remember, they had given up all hope earlier. They didn't think they could be saved. Verse 27, on the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic. When about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors left, let the lifeboat down to the sea, pretending that they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the rope that held the lifeboat and let it fall away. So a couple of different things. It shows the centurion and all the soldiers really trusted and were listening to Paul now, taking his advice seriously. But it also shows that God's sovereignty works with human responsibility. In other words, Paul had always said, not one hair, your head's going to purge perish, I'm going to take, you know, not one loss, life will be lost. But there was a requirement with that, and that was that they all had to stay together. And the sailor's plan was to lower the, you know, falsely lower the lifeboat. They would get in it, and they would scoot off and leave the rest of them there. But the soldiers, the centurion, believed Paul, so they even cut the lifeboat away. So it shows God's sovereignty and human responsibility working together. Verse 33 says, Just before dawn, Paul urged all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You have, haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he had said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. So Paul exemplifies his faith in verse 36, they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Although there were 276 of us on board, when they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. So, they were not fasting, you know, spiritually fasting. They were fasting because the ship had been doing this, Many had probably been seasick. They had been fearful because the storm was raging, tearing up the ship. So food was not really a high priority during that time. But Paul says, you need to keep up your strength. So he breaks bread. He himself blesses it and encourages them in that way. Now, it's interesting that it says... Paul, or 
Luke makes the point saying there were 276 of us on board. There, a lot of scholars have different opinions of this. Some will think, well, you know, as you look through what Luke has already written, how he talked about, you know, all the different ports they stopped at, you know, details, a lot of details. But some others believe that the 276 has a significance. It's, it's like, uh, there's another case of this we have in the New Testament where in John, uh, what is it, John chapter 21, where uh the disciples have gone out to fish. This is after the crucifixion. And they've been fishing all night and haven't caught anything. And then Jesus comes up on the shore. He says, put your nets on the other side. And they do that. And they got such a haul of fish. But it says 153 large fish. So why was it important to know there's 153 large fish. And so a lot of different scholars have different opinions. I had written in my Bible, and I, I, I didn't go back and research why, but it, I had written next to that scripture in John that something to do with, it, with the sons of, sons of God. But the 276 people, I had looked up uh, a long article on it, and it would take probably 20 minutes and you might probably be lost before we got to the end of it. But basically, he was saying it's uh, uh, gematria, which is in Hebrew, letters have numbers, and numbers mean letters. So in this case, uh, if you took all that together, just to make it very short, it comes to in Hebrew, it says Yahweh or righteousness. So 276, you take those numbers, use, and go to the Hebrew, and it comes out to be Yahweh is our righteousness. Now, is that it? I don't know. Or it could be that Luke is just a real, real detailed person, and he wants you to know there's 276 people on there. We can't say. All right, verse 39 through 41. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Now, cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea, and at the same time, they untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken into pieces by the pounding of the surf. So they're making a, a desperate run to try to get to this beach so they could get on the beach, but in fact, fortunately, they get grounded on a sandbar. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life, and he kept them from carrying out their plans. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached safety. So this shows the favor that Paul had because the soldiers were going to kill all the prisoners because, again, as a Roman soldier, if you let prisoners escape, you would pay with your own life. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul particularly, kept them from carrying out their plans. So he had, by this time, Paul had great favor with the, really with the soldiers and with the centurion. So this is where it leads. So they're going, and you'll find out they're going to be landing on a, a island called Malta. And Nathan will be teaching that in two weeks. But again, remember that storms, a couple different things for us, I think, is impatience. 
Remember, if you, if you don't know the next thing, wait. Wait on the Lord. And the storms of life, which will come and will affect all of us, to have peace in the midst of the storm, even though we didn't, can't see the answers, just knowing that the Lord is faithful. Now, there is one verse I want to look at. I'm going to skip a little ahead in verse 28, verse 15. It's actually one word I want to look at. But the next chapter, 28, verse 15, I want to read that. And this is where, Rome, or where Paul has finally made it uh, into Italy and he's coming into Rome. And in verse 15, it says, the brothers there in Rome, in other words, had heard that we were coming. And they traveled as far as the form of Apeus and to the three taverns to meet us. So the word I want to look at is meet. Now in English, we have one word, meet. You've got to meet somebody from coffee, you know, whatever. In Greek, there can be different meanings. And this affects, it might affect your eschatology outlook because the Greek term is used here and it's also going to be used in First Thessalonians. And the Greek term is apentis, that's A-P-E-N-T-E-S-I-S. And I'll read you the definition. It says it's often used of an important dignitary reception by the inhabitants of a city who come out to greet and welcome their honored guest and then to accompany him into the city. So it'd be like, let's say the president came to Kansas City. So the mayor and all the city officials, they would go out to meet the president, and then they would accompany him into town, okay? Now where this is also used, the other, only other place is First Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In verse 16 and 17. So Paul is talking about the coming of the Lord. In verse 16 he says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with a voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet, again, that is that Greek word, epentis, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Now, in that First Thessalonians, you read the rest of that definition. With that particular verse, it said it indicates that the subsequent movement of the saints after meeting Christ in the air and then conforms to Christ's direction in a downward motion towards up, towards earth. So in other words, just like Paul, as he was coming in, the saints came out of uh, Rome to meet him and then accompany him back. So it's the same picture here in 1 Thessalonians 4 as we go to meet the Lord and then we, he doesn't turn around and go, we turn around with him as he comes to earth. So again, it might change your thinking a little bit on eschatology. All right, so that's Acts Chapter 27, we have one left to go. So we want to have an opportunity for anyone who needs prayer, whether it's something for healing or financial, whatever is going on in your life, you want someone to pray for you. We're going to have a song uh, at the end. And if you need to go, you can go ahead and pick up your children. But let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we just thank you. 
again for your word. It is so rich, Lord, and there's so much we learn from it. Lord, the application for us today. So, Lord, we ask that you would just cement this word in our hearts, in our minds. And, Lord, that as we face the storms, the inevitable storms that will come into our lives, Lord, whether that's a financial storm, a health storm, a relationship storm, Lord, that just as Jesus was in the boat asleep as a raging storm was going on outside and that the disciples who are our well-experienced fishermen came to him and said, Lord, don't you care? We are perishing. And he got up and rebuked the storm and then rebuked the disciples for their lack of faith. So Lord, help us to trust you, to have faith in you, that, Lord, as these storms come, and they will come, Lord, that you are faithful, that you never leave us, that you never forsake us. And, Lord, we have that confidence in you, Lord, that you love us. You have the best in mind for each one of us, Lord. So, Lord, we just want to yield ourselves to you And, Lord, be all we are for you, Lord. So we ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.